Hello, it's APA Days Helsinki again, and I'm here with Prez Zemek, sorry, Zemek <laughs> from Software AG. And you had some experiences to share first about your kind of the sudden remote experience that we are all having this spring. Mm -hmm. Would you want to share? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, in, in my job, working from home is, is not new. So I can share some long time experience with you. Uh, when I'm not traveling, I do work from home, and I know it's new for, for many people throughout the world these days. So a few tips from my experience. Uh, first of all, have a designated area at home where you work. If you, if you don't have a room that you can lock down, at least have a place at home that you consider work. This could be a place at the table or a chair or something. And Whatever it is, just have it designated so that you you know that when you're sitting there, you're at work. Um, and make sure your computer does not leave this space because when you leave this space, you're not at work anymore, right? Or if your computer leaves the space, it leaves with you for other reasons than work. You need some discipline here. Uh, other, another thing is that because now we have um, you know, members of our family at home as well, you know, kids are running around because school is closed and, you know, there, there are people uh, walking around. So make sure they know you're at work and where you are at work so they don't, you know, enter suddenly asking whether you want the beer cold or not, right? Um, and, and lastly, uh, last thing is, again, you, you need some self-discipline um, and you need to keep your daily routine in terms of knowing when you work. It is very easy, believe me, I've been there, done that. It is very easy to start working at 6 a.m. and finish at 10 a.m. and then explain yourself that, you know, but I was making breaks in, in the meantime, so I'm okay. You're not okay. It's It's good for the short time, but in the longer run, your body and your mind will not appreciate it. So uh, keep to your daily routine as if you were at the office. And uh, one last thing that is maybe not directly related to, to this, but, but gets more meaning now that, you know, other people are working from home and we're seeing more and more meetings in our calendars that are paralyzing our job uh, sometimes. Designate one day in a week as a no meeting day so that you can do your job, not, not somebody else's job. Good luck. Those are very uh, good advices and I, I could tick almost all the boxes. At least my kids know that uh, if I have my earphones on, they should not disturb mm -hmm. me. And I do have that designated pace. But yeah, it, it's sometimes like you have to have like a 24-7 or no, 24-5 um, kind of a, a schedule. It happens too. It, 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 it happens when you're working with... Uh, all kinds of people from all kinds of time zones <laughs> and, and organizing a conference. But yeah, you're absolutely right. You should mm -hmm. not do that. And now you have some other stage advice. Uh, you, you have this kind of theme in, in remote work and in uh, applications, it seems, and microservices that you should take control. It, it yes. seems to be your thing. <laughs> so go ahead, take a control of microservices, please. Sure, sure, thank you. So yes, the topic is app, app mesh and I will demystify it because um, it, it's probably not obvious for, for everybody. So um, again, my name is Przemek Kulik and I'm from Software AG. I represent the product management team uh, uh, in Software AG. And I will be speaking about App Mesh, about microservices, service mesh, and related technologies. But let me start with a question. And because I haven't seen anybody else asking this question, I'm quoting myself here, just now, right here. And the question is, what is wrong with the service mesh? And don't get me wrong, I'm a fan. I, I love service mesh. I love what it represents and what it is trying to do. But I want to put the emphasis on the on the what world in this in this question because that is something that um, um, I have seen when talking to my customers and others. Uh, 
that was prohibiting them from ripping the benefits from uh, technologies such as service mesh. And I will uh, demystify it. I will try to answer this what part of the question. Service mesh itself, very good. There's something missing and we will try to um, address it. But let's take it step by step. Microservices or distributed architectures are becoming the de facto standard when we build new things in, in our organizations. Uh, when we start something new, we almost never go for the monolith anymore, right? We don't want to build the monolithic applications for good reasons. And more often, we are, uh, when we start new projects for existing uh, solutions that we have built, we are trying to decompose the monolith for all the good reasons, right? Because when we embrace the microservices, we can be more agile. Uh, when we want to release a single feature sooner to the market uh, and the uh, application is monolithic, we need to you know, take the full application through the testing cycle and whatnot. And this takes time and effort and money and uh, we might miss the opportunity, but Slicing and dicing this in smaller chunks, we can isolate the work where we need to work on this feature and we'll release just this part and be quicker to the market. And we are not dependent on the other teams working on other features so we can work um, according to our schedule. So it gives us a lot of flexibility and agility on how we work in our solutions. However, this does, does not come you know, free of cost because you know, nothing in the nature gets lost. So, uh, while we're achieving this flexibility and you know, removing the co complexity for us, we're actually pushing this to somebody else's desk. Uh, in, in this case, we are um, pushing the complexity that we create by dividing the application in the smaller chunks to the operations teams. They will need to be able to, to run the application that consists of, of smaller pieces instead of running one. And you know, I've, I think everybody will agree that running one application, it's easier than running 10 applications because, you know, 10 versus one. Uh, so uh, the complexity does not go away. We are achieving the flexibility and agility for, you know, there's a trade-off between one and, um, and the other. And imagine, you know, with time, we build more and more of these microservices of the solutions that are based on microservices, or simply we have a distributed architecture that, that consists of multiple, uh, multiple applications. Um, you know, as it grows with time in numbers, we're starting to, to answer, uh, ask ourselves questions, you know, how, how do we make sure that service A can find service B? Uh, how do we make sure that, um, um, we recover from failures. When, when one service you know, fails, how do, we, how do we recover from this failure? How do we prevent these failures so the entire application keeps working? Um, how do we understand what is going on? How do we monitor these things? How do we access logs? You know, all these questions that, that seem basic, all of a sudden they get a different meaning when we're talking about distributed architectures. How do we ensure basic security? How do we, um, you know, again, monitor the things? How do we um, set up throttles and things like that? Uh, I hope you will not say that the answer to this question is we simply code it into the service, right? Being a developer, I would love to do my happy coding, code the uh, business logic for my service and not, um, care much about you know the client side discovery of the APIs I'm using or logging or security. I will expect the infrastructure to do this for me, right? I just code the business logic, drop it on the um, infrastructure we run on, and the rest happens. Security clicks in, uh, traffic management clicks in, logging happens, tracing is there. I can monitor things. Is it too much to expect? Well, no. That's that's the obvious things right now. That's how it should happen. However, um, you know, from making it happen or wanting this to happen to, to making it happen, uh, there's a few steps to, uh, to go, right? And this is, this is pretty difficult, even if we take into account um, container orchestration uh, platforms such as Kubernetes and others. 
Um, enter service mesh. Service mesh and service mesh implementations on the market, they, they bring the promise of making it easy. Meaning they will, they will do this magic for you so that you can drop your microservice into the landscape and things will happen. And this promise is, is almost achieved. And I'm slowly getting to um, the, the what part of my question from the beginning. So service mesh implementations will give you the abstraction layer over your um, container orchestration platform so that discovery happens, so that monitoring tracing is there, so that you recover from failures, so things can connect with each other. And, and, and many other things, right? So you will be able to do, um, you know, simple or maybe not simple, but you will be able to do some annotations to, to make things happen in your, in your environment so that um, when you have a new microservice to, to run there, you'll just deploy it over there and it nicely clicks together with the rest of the, of the pieces. But it's missing something. Um, because of the nature of uh, the service mesh implementations, um, the things that you're getting from them are working on the network layer of the stack. They're working on layer four of the stack. Uh, and in and by itself, it, there's nothing wrong with it. But when we um, deal with APIs, when we are API providers or application owners, network level is not the language we like to talk. So we like to talk about APIs, their contracts, uh, uh, application level enforcements. I, I may want to be able to set up, you know, JWT, um, JSON Web Token uh, based security that, that gives you some more context about the user uh, in, as opposed to setting something on the network layer only that doesn't, doesn't give me this context. I may want to be able to set up uh, routing policies that are based on the content of the messages being ex exchanged. For example, if the customer is from, um, from Finland, I will route them here. If the customer is from Sweden, I will route them elsewhere. Or if uh, the query is about a specific product, I will use this microservice and, and whatnot. I may want to do things like data masking or, or, or anything that, that bases on the content of the messages being exchanged. Service mesh will fall short here because they do not go above the network level of the stack. So we need to add something to the service mesh uh, to bring this level back so that we can, we can find it useful. This single thing is the prohibiting factor uh, that I've seen talking to customers when they want to utilize service mesh. I talked to customers who were trying to, uh, to use uh, Istio and other solutions in their projects. Uh, and they were pretty far in advance with, with, the, uh, with their pilots, but they never went into production because they really couldn't make it useful and usable for them because of the nature of the service mesh. So um, this is the what. This is the what is wrong with service mesh. It is missing the application context. It is missing the business context. And we need to add this context over there, which is something that we are addressing with the concept of app mesh. So we're connecting uh, the best of the two worlds. So service mesh with all the goodness it gives, with all the features it gives you, with the ability to add the missing application and API context so that we can understand what APIs are in the service mesh so that we can um, learn about their contract and uh, how they work so that we can uh, enforce our policies on top of the policies that are already there um, in, in Istio, for example, so that we can have some visibility over the exchanges between the microservices, not only in network terms, not only seeing that, you know, A called B, but also uh, seeing that, you know, a send the message to B uh, about you know, this particular product and the response was that, so that we can run meaningful analytics that our business users will, will want. Um, so uh, at Software AG, we are realizing this with, with AppMesh that essentially um, can give you, uh, you know, these three things on a very high level when it comes to, uh, to benefits. 
you, you get control over what you have in your service mesh in terms of applications you run, not in terms of um, some, some network exchanges. So you, you will be able to group your microservices and treat them as applications and think about them this way and talk about them this way, still, um, you know, reaping the benefits of, of running in service mesh and getting, getting, you know, getting all this magic that service mesh does. You will also be able to govern this centrally, right? Um, because service mesh can consist of multiple microservices and understanding what is happening there is one thing, but, but also depending on your design, whether this is the main driven design or something else, you may have multiple meshes, multiple service meshes, and the mesh of meshes, and I'm not kidding you, these things exist, right? So you will want to have one central place to, uh, to govern it, and um, AppMesh will give you something like this. And lastly, uh, with the things we're doing with AppMesh, by adding this application context, you are uh, achieving more flexibility and more agility into bringing new features, if you will, or making, you know, stuff happen in, uh, in the service mesh without actually changing the source code of your services. You remember this notion of, you know, me doing the happy coding as a developer, that I don't want to care, care about, you know, data masking or specific application security and the infrastructure do this for me, this is the thing. I don't want to be forced to recode my microservice because someone at the end of the applications want to change. The infrastructure should be able to do these things for me. Um, we do have a demo available about it. Uh, I will not do this right now for the sake of time, but I'll just guide you through this and point you to where you can see this. So the demo showcases a functional brand factory um, organization that, that has an e-commerce site, uh, which is marketing products from, from different, different brands. Um, they have built it uh, on a microservices-based architecture on, on Kubernetes and on Istio. And um, they have a set of microservices that are you know, common for the um, entire solution, like shipping, billing, uh, invoicing, and, and whatnot. And they have microservices serving data about the products from a particular brand. And they face some challenges when they want to take it to the next level. So they want to provide some personalized experience to the consumer browsing the e-commerce side. So that you know, if I'm a male, from, from Poland, I would like to see products for men and hopefully in my currency and I want them to remember me and, and, and whatnot. Um, so you know, service mesh implementations will fall short here because again, they, they work on the network level so they will not be able to understand who is the user that I'm, I'm a male and I shop for this and for that. So. How do you tackle this? How do you add this application level enforcement to tell the, the application that this is a guy and he, he needs these products? How do you personalize this experience without changing the code of your microservices? Uh, another challenge is that how do you approach the topic of adding a new microservice? Let's say we want to add a new product brand to our e-commerce site. How do we make it so uh, without actually, again, recoding the, our application so that it takes advantage of these new microservices and reaches for the new data. Again, service mesh will fall short here. So what we're demoing there is we are showing how the app mesh can introspect uh, the service mesh, bring the services for your visibility, um, update the API contract, uh, from where you can take the full advantage of the power of API Gateway to add uh, application level security JOT claims in this, um, in, in this case, so that you know, the application can introspect these claims and know who I am as a, as a consumer and, and use this information to tailor the experience on the, on the e-commerce uh, side. Um, but also we'll be able to provide some, some transformation. So for example, I can, I can ask the API gateway to, to parse the, uh, the, the job to read the claims and, and pass it to the application. But it will also give, give me later 
um, the um, monitoring piece of what was happening in the application for specific users, for specific products, for specific locations, all basing on the message content being exchanged between microservices. We also demo the second use case, uh, which is about bringing a new microservice. So we, you will see us um, bringing, new, bringing a new microservices to, to, the, to the service mesh and uh, integrating them with the rest without making a single uh, code line change to have this in, in integration happening. Uh, on this slide, you have the links to these videos, videos uh, on YouTube. Um, if you're interested, make sure you go there and, and, and see what it does. Um, now that you know, um, I told you what is wrong with the service mesh, how we can address it to close this gap and make it useful and you know um, what it gives you. Let me tell you a little bit how this is realized on the architectural level. So when we take a look at service mesh implementations, in this case, uh, this slide talks about Istio. Uh, it comprises of uh, the control plane and then data plane. Control plane is the area where you have multiple modules responsible for um, things like, you know, security, uh, uh, policies, uh, observability, monitoring, tracing, right? They have these modules uh, with the fancy names like Citadel, Mixer, Pilot, Galley, and whatnot. They are responsible for different pieces of controlling how the service mesh behaves. On the other side, we have the data plane, which is, which is the place where our microservices run. So we have our services that, that connect to each other, and uh, there's one piece from the East implementation here. This is the um, Envoy HTTP proxy that, that makes sure that uh, these things are actually, are actually connected. So uh, what we are doing to complete the AppMesh stories, we are adding um, our API gateway to the control plane um, for defining your enforcements in design time. And, uh, when we need to inject this uh, enforcement later on, API Gateway does it with um, the use of our micro gateway. Um, that does it in an unintrusive way so that these two pieces work the way they work, and we just add something on top of it, adding this application context. In provisioning, it works in a way that first, we um, pro provide the visibility, the introspection, the lookup into what is available in the data plane so that you can see. Then when you select the services that you want to do something with, you use uh, the API gateway functionality to update your API contract, to set up the policies, whether this is, you know, um, the JSON web token based security or OAuth or whatnot, or maybe basic authentication, whatever you want. You can enforce policies you know, do data masking, do transformation of the payloads, whatever you want, you have full um, power of API Gateway at your disposal. And when you're ready, you only need to make sure that whatever you define uh, will happen in runtime. And that is done by, you know, injecting a micro gateway as a sidecar to the service to, uh, to make sure that these things that you, you define will happen when people call these services. Uh, so that in runtime, uh, it works in a way that uh, nothing breaks for the current users. So people who have been using it or services who have been using it, uh, nothing changes for them. They continue using the services that they, um, the way they were using them. We just add our micro gateway sidecar uh, to enforce the additional things on the application level with the business context you want it. And that's that's it. That's the that's the entire story. Uh, it sounds simple, sounds magical, uh, but it works, and it makes the service mesh usable and useful for you. That's all I had for you today. We can open it up for questions. Okay, so more questions, of course, coming from the live sessions. But uh, just as a kind of a very simple question, hopefully, is that I mean I've I've uh, fought with uh, some junior developers out there who do don't understand that there is uh, other things than, than internet um, existing in enterprise grade <laughs> networks and and you have like all kinds of different networks you have like all kinds of clouds and server environments so how does the kind of connection co connectivity with this 
app mesh uh, work. So is it less the same as in, in kind of Istio and service mesh in general, so that they don't really kind of care about the connectivity or does it bring anything there? It's pretty much transparent, right? So uh, to be able to work with service mesh, of course, you need to be able to connect to it, right? Regardless of why and, and how. So uh, if you want to utilize app mesh with service mesh, uh, it, it needs to be connected to, to service mesh. But whether it, it is running on on the cloud, on one of the hyperscalers, or whether this is run on premises, this is this is transparent. As long as there is connectivity, um, the feature functions are pretty much the same. Okay, and can you kind of uh, combine like different services in different um, environments on uh, into the same app mesh, or does it kind of is it in one environment that you have like one? Mesh that is, that is a very good question. So uh, when I was showing this, this uh, slide with three main benefits of, of AppMesh, one of them was, um, you know, single uh, place to, to control it all. So mm -hmm. yes, we can have AppMesh control multiple service meshes, uh, potentially running in different places. And this would, this will become uh, a kind of like control plane for, for the meshes that will bring them all together in one place mm -hmm. for, for visibility, for control, for governance. Okay. This may be a stupid question because maybe you told it, but there were so many things in your presentation that mm -hmm. uh, I had to keep track. So, so what about like API management and app mesh? How do they kind of compare or work together or live in sync? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. AppMesh is a capability of our API management, right? So, Service Mesh is kind of um, external to API management, but Service Mesh will host our microservices, which will expose APIs. So, we, from the API management point of view, from the API provider's point of view, we want to manage these APIs. That, that's what we do. So. For us, uh, API product managers, API providers, it should be transparent whether this, these APIs are hosted on top of some, you know, all, you know, off-the-shelf solution we have, or whether they are they are exposed on top of the integration platform we have, or on top of you know um, any other applications we have built, or inside of service mesh. It should be transparent for me where these APIs are. I just want to manage them in one place the same way regardless of the backend implementation. And this is the connection between API management and service mesh and other backends that uh, could run APIs for. Yeah, I think that that's just an important thing for the audience to understand because I've seen also confusions about like al already Istio, for example, that mm -hmm. like Istio would be the app uh, replacement for API management mm -hmm. or even a replacement for kind of um, this uh, network connectivity. <laughs> I mean, if you just have Istio there, everything is going to be fine and, and you don't need anything else. And I think that is a, a grave misunderstanding that, that exactly. shouldn't that's a, that's happen a very here. Valid point. Yeah. Yes. But hey, good. Uh, I think that that covers all the things that I had in mind and probably your audience will have even more great questions. So thank sure. you and well, it was nice to have you virtually in Helsinki, hopefully next time for real. <laughs> Thanks for hosting me. No problem.